Okay, welcome everyone to today's seminar. I'm happy to announce that um, Kevin Buzzard will give a presentation today about formalizing mathematics using a theorem prover. Um, Kevin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So thank you to Philip and to Miriam and uh, Jared for the invitation. Uh, and I'm just gonna, I mean, this is not a hard going talk, right? This is a, this is a, this is going to be very, you know, this is a light talk, right? This is just a discussion about what I've been doing for the last few years. Uh, so I'd start, you know, a brief history, you know, a one slide summary of what I'm going to say. Uh, is I, you know, I started off being an algebraic number theorist. I just did, I got a PhD under Richard Taylor uh, in, uh, you know, in the, the mid-90s. Uh, and I got a tenure job at Imperial College London, and I've been doing algebraic number theory, of the Langlands philosophy, trendy, trendy mathematics, uh, and not really using computers too much at all. Uh, you know, all my proofs were pencil and paper proofs. I would use computers to you know, write up proofs, to write LaTeX documents. Uh, and occasionally I would do calculations, computations. I wouldn't proof theorems. Uh, I would do computations. But and certainly I had colleagues uh, who would not use computers at all you know, to do as part of their research. So I'm happy to use this phrase in this talk, this, this idea about proper mathematics. Right? This, this offends some mathematicians, but I think I'm mostly you know, speaking to you know, people who are in the you know, in, in industry now. Right? So uh, pro proper mathematics is the kind of mathematics which attracts funding and which is fashionable. Uh, and as I say, this was something I did, you know, my area turned out, I was lucky. The area I was in has been fashionable for about 25 years, you know, over 25 years. I, I, I started uh, Andrew Wiles proof formats last year when I was a PhD student using the techniques uh, which I'd been learning in my PhD thesis. Uh, so I've been extremely lucky that you know, I've, been, I've been doing fashionable mathematics and I've been able to get grant money and things like this. Uh, and you know you do have this feeling that you know, there's a certain class of you know, people, you know, people I know, you know, sort of slightly perhaps a certain snobbery that you know, is well aware that people like me are doing proper math proper mathematics. So I did proper mathematics. So of course you don't need computers to do proper mathematics because you know you don't prove theorems by you know these ugly things like the four color theorem where you have to check thousands of special cases. Yeah, what a crappy proof that is. You want to find the the conceptual proof where everything comes out and you don't need to do any computations at all. You know, you just do pure reasoning and uh, things drop out beautifully. So that's what proper mathematics looks like. And, uh, you know, I talk about this half in jest now, really, because now I, to a certain extent, I think that proper mathematicians are part of the problem now. But, uh, uh, but I did proper mathematics for 20 odd years. And then in mid 2017, I just got interested in uh, these theorem provers actually because I thought they might be useful for teaching. You know, I'm interested in teaching, both my parents were teachers. So I started experimenting with these computer proof systems. And uh, and I'm really just gonna tell you the story of what happened since then. So I was kind of, you know, you know, the summary of the talk is I was a bit shocked to discover, firstly, you know, how much potential they had. Secondly, how little had been done. You know, obviously I knew that mathematicians weren't interested in these systems. But I also began to perceive that you know, computer scientists were perhaps doing the wrong thing, or you know, perhaps doing, you know, doing unfashionable mathematics. This is the problem. Proper mathematicians are going to be interested if you're doing proper mathematics. And I think it's absolutely obvious that these systems can change mathematics. Not, I, I'm not, I don't believe that you know, all humans, all mathematicians are going to start using these systems to do their mathematics. That's, you know, that's not going to happen. I know plenty of mathematicians who are just, you know, absolutely no interest in computers at all. Uh, but these systems will begin to, you know, they'll give us tools that will turn into tools uh, which we researchers will be able to use uh, once mathematicians start noticing that they're there. So I'm going to talk about my efforts to get mathematicians on board uh, because I think that's a big you know, sociological problem we have. You know, just as many computer scientists don't need to verify their code because, you know, write some unit tests and it should be fine, right? Uh, many mathematicians feel that they don't need to verify their proofs. Uh, so I've got to get them on board. So how did it all start? Summer 2017. 
I dabbled with a few systems. I was trying to figure out you know, what, what the landscape was, you know, which one would be best to teach with. Really. But then coincidentally, there was a conference in Cambridge called Big Proof. And uh, the first talk was given by Tom Hales, who's a, a prestigious mathematician. And he's also an algebraic number theory. Well, he has worked in algebraic number theory. Uh, my area, I read one of his papers and was very impressed by its clarity. I mean, he was clearly a very, very clear thinker, which is something you know, I have a, you know, for me, that's a, an important thing. You know, I like clear thinking. Uh, and he was, you know, talking about a world where, you know, people were still writing mathematical papers, but the, you know, the main statements were being formally stated. You know, not, we're not talking about formalizing proofs, formalizing all known proofs currently is impossible because you know, machine, because computers can't read natural language, let alone translate it uh, into formal mathematics. So Hales was just dreaming of a world where you know, certain mathematicians you know, were, were formalizing statements of theorems. And so you know, then maybe that would lead to AI doing great stuff. And I found his arguments extremely persuasive. It seemed to me that you know, these systems I became more and more convinced that these systems could change mathematics. And Hales just said he was going to use a system called Lean. You know, he, was, uh, he, was, he was going to, you know, this system called Lean, which I'd never heard of at the time. Uh, but because, you know, I had a lot of respect for Hales, I chose Lean. So, you know, there's, you know, there's a list of systems, probably many people in this, many people in this talk are aware of these systems. But if I was giving this talk in a mathematics department, you can pretty much guarantee that you know, nobody in the audience, certainly the proper mathematicians in the audience, you know, there might be people that do, you know, unfashionable things like you know, foundations or logic or something like this. And those people might well be aware of these systems. Some of them might even be using them. But somehow the proper mathematicians, you know, the ones getting the fields medals, have never heard of these systems. And this is the problem. So I thought I'd go with Lean. Uh, oh, I just realized I can't actually see. Look, oops. Great. Uh, so I decided to start with Lean. And uh, so just very briefly, what's Lean? Lean is uh, backed by Microsoft. And, you know, 15 years ago, I loathed Microsoft with every fiber of my being. I, you know, I thought they were a wicked company because you know, they were trying to destroy my chosen operating system, which was Linux. Uh, but they, they're, you know, they're, they seem to have really changed over the last decade. You know, you know Things have changed at the top, and uh, Lean is free and open source, and and it runs, and, you know, it runs on operating systems other than Windows. It runs on, it runs absolutely great on Linux. I think it actually runs better on Linux uh, than on Windows. Uh, so it has Microsoft behind it. So a lot of these other systems are developed by, you know, are developed by you know small teams of uh, computer science, you know, academics. So you know, I don't know if that makes it different to the other systems. I mean, time will tell whether that really makes a difference. Uh, but one thing that Lean, you know, that Lean came with was a manual theorem improving in Lean. And I read this manual you know, three times. I, you know, I struggled to read it the first time. I, you know, I didn't really know much about functional programming. I kind of plowed through learning about Haskell. Uh, but I started to read this book and you could, you know, I could, I could see the difference between Lean and Haskell. In Lean, you could you know, do little basic logic problems that like, you know, proving that A and B implied B and A. Uh, but, you know, you could actually prove this. It wasn't just, you weren't just doing computations, you could do reasoning. Uh, so I, you know, I, I did, this book has exercises in it, and I would do some of the exercises. I tried some basic logic proofs, and it worked really well. But what I was really interested in uh, was getting this, you know, seeing if I could use this system uh, with my undergraduate. Uh, and so I started, I started to you know, use it to try and do mathematics in the wild. You know, I took the course that I, I was teaching a course, the introduction, the introduction to proof course. Uh, it's a first year undergraduates at Imperial College London. Uh, I was teaching, you know, the very first course they would go to, you know, an introduction to pure mathematics. So I was, you know, and, and in this course, we would do very, very basic stuff. But at school, you know, kids in the UK at school don't maybe learn, you know, they learn how to do computations, but they don't learn uh, so much about proofs. They do some basic Euclidean geometry, but not so much of it. You know, it's mostly computation, you know, compute the value of this integral, that sort of thing. So I have this introduction to proof course that's been around for decades. You know, I was lecturing it 20 years ago, and then I took a break. 
And then I came back to it, but I have these notes and I thought, well, here are the notes. You know, this is real mathematics. Uh, let's try formalizing it in lean. And I learned quite quickly that, uh, that maybe, you know, actually maybe these, <laughs> maybe these examples in theory of proving it may be very carefully crafted to make things look easy. Right? And maybe formalizing mathematics was actually more difficult than I thought it was. Uh, and of course, also I'm using, you know, lean is quite a new system. And these maths library appeared in 2017, you know, the same year that I appeared. Uh, these other systems like Koch and Isabel have got extensive libraries uh, that go back, you know, Cox, Cox has been around for over 30 years. Uh, so let me give you some examples. The next few slides are just examples of things that showed up in my course uh, that I was trying to do in Lean. So here's a great example. This is the first, uh, the first problem sheet. Uh, the first part of the first question on the first problem sheet I was giving the undergraduates. So I was playing with this over the summer before the course started, summer of 2017. I was in UC Berkeley, uh, supposed to be doing number theory, but actually I've been completely distracted. Uh, and I was spending a lot of time you know, doing undergraduate level mathematics on my computer. So true or false, let x be a real number, then x squared minus 3x plus 2 equals 0 implies x equals 1. This is the question. Uh, and the, the point of this is I'm trying to teach students what this implication symbol means. I don't know if you can see, I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer. I've never used Google Meet before. I don't know exactly what it shares. Yeah, can we can see the mouse. Oh, okay. So it's, I'm trying to teach you. The real question is, what does this implication symbol mean? So Lean falls, knows full well what this implication symbol means, right? Uh, and Lean does have the real numbers as well, it turns out. So I can formalize the statement that x be a real number, then you know, true or false, x squared minus 3x plus 2 is 0 implies x equals 1. Uh, and of course, on the, you know, on the answer, you know, I explain that it's false, right? Just let x be 2, uh, because then, you know, the left-hand side doesn't imply the right-hand side. Uh, so I, you know, I type this into lean, you know, in the, you're formalizing things, you have, you know, you have a goal that you're working on, and after a while, you, you know, you, you use enough stuff, you use tactics, and... Uh, Eventually, this goal disappears, and you get a little message saying, you know, goal's accomplished. So I, I let x be 2, fully expecting one goal to become zero goals. And in fact, one goal became two goals, to my slight surprise. And the two goals were this, right? Firstly, the system wants me to prove that 2 squared minus 3 times 2 plus 2 is 0. And secondly, it wants me to prove that 2 is not equal to 1. Uh, and now this is funny, right? So what little I know about computer programming, you know, I know that the reals are floats, right? And uh, floats are just, you know, it's obvious that the float two is not the float one because floats have some internal representation and the internal representations are different. And so two is clearly not one. But like in Lean, these are not computer science real numbers, right? These are proper maths real numbers. These are, you know, equivalent classes of Cauchy sequences. You know, there's uncountably many reals, uh, not a finite, you know, there's a finite number of floats. Uh, but I can construct, I can construct infinitely many real numbers, like all the natural numbers. So all of a sudden, I realised I didn't quite know what I was doing here. Uh, so I'm sitting there in Berkeley on my laptop with a Wi-Fi connection, uh, stuck. And so I ask on the Lean chat. There's a chat. Right? There's a small community. This is 2017. There's a small community, uh, and I ask how to prove two is not equal to one. And so, so I get a response: which two, right? Uh, which, of course, to a mathematician, you know, you give this talk in a maths department, you get a laugh at this point because there's only what everyone knows. You know, there's only one two, right? So which two replies an expert? And now I know enough about type theory to know that you know there are different twos because you know terms have got a type, and uh, the natural number two is not the same as the real number two because they've got different types. So it doesn't even make sense to say that they're equal. So which two? And uh, on the problem sheet, you know, I don't need I could have been working with the integers, but on the problem sheet, I had said real numbers. So I say, well, you know, the honest answer is it's the real number two. Uh, I'm, I'm told that this is hard. So, you know, somehow this is a step backwards. Uh, and in fact, if I was using a more mature system like Hock or Isabel, this would not be hard. So this is hard, apparently, in Lean. Lean has the real numbers. Lean has, you know, the official construction of the mathematician's real numbers and various, you know, proofs that it's a complete Archimedean ordered field. Uh, but it doesn't have a proof readily available that two is not equal to one. 
so the computer scientists informed me that it would be easier if I was using a sem you know, more sensible number system like the natural numbers, uh, where you, you can prove that two is not equal to one because the natural numbers have got decidable equality, of course. So there are algorithms that can check if two natural numbers are equal. Uh, but of course, unfortunately, if I'm using the natural numbers, then the first statement is false, right? Because two squared is four and three, two to six, but four minus six is zero uh, because you know, the natural numbers don't have any negative numbers in and natural number subtraction is forced to return a natural number. The type, you know, the, uh, the type of subtraction, it takes two terms of type alpha and returns a term of type alpha. Uh, so, you know, in, in the end, I figure that, well, we could stick with the integers and then in the integers, at least everything is true and it's not too difficult to muddle through till the end. But, you know, I expressed some concern uh, that this was, you know, something that first year undergraduates were expected to find trivial, uh, and it clearly wasn't trivial. I also realised that you know I was finding a lot of humour in this software. Right? You know, the fact that the fact that it points out that two is not equal to one needs a proof. You know that's something I hadn't really noticed. You know, I just thought two was obviously not equal to one. But when I you know when I began to think about it, I began to realise that you know what is two to lean two is some equivalence class of Cauchy sequences. You know it's quite a, a complicated mathematical object. Uh, and I realized that actually this is the correct response, right? If a student asked me how to prove that two was not equal to one, you know, I, I realized I would have to think about this. Uh, so, I, you know, I think this is funny. I'm sort of motivated to continue. I, I can do this question for the integers. So I, you know, I changed my problem sheet around a bit. I figure I'll yeah, let's just do it for the integers. But actually what happens is a few days later, some kid, you know, some MSc student uh, in the philosophy department at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, wrote a tactic called the normalized numerals tactic and this tactic solved all those goals the tactic solved both of those goals so now I, I could forget about the integers i could go back to the real numbers uh but i could i could now solve this problem and you know one of course one of the big issues is that this is supposed to be a trivial problem right this is supposed to be easy and now all of a sudden i'm using some fancy tactic right but this software the idea is the software you type in the problem and, uh, and it becomes a computer game, and then you have to solve the computer game. But I thought reading theorem and proving in lean would give me all the tools I needed to solve this computer game. And all of a sudden, I've got to use this brand spanking new undocumented tactic to solve this. So I realized that, you know, perhaps this translation isn't going to go so well. But somehow there was just enough to keep me interested. You know, what did, what did this, this thing, you know, it had sets and finite sets. And now, you know, groups, rings and fields, the stuff that, you know, we were teaching the first years, topological spaces we were teaching the second years. You know, it, it had a basic theory of some basic objects which were being taught in Imperial College's maths department. And Imperial College has got a proper maths department where we teach proper mathematics. So there was just about enough to keep me interested. You know, somehow if it had been in a more primitive state, I wouldn't have been able to get started. Uh, and it also had... Yeah, so really, really, you know, the library was really solid. Yeah, but I say I had finite sets. It had, you know, you know three thousand lines of code about finite sets. You know, lots everything you needed about you know, the basic stuff you would expect in a library of finite sets was all there. Uh -huh. I spoke Johannes Hultzel. There's supposed to be an umlaut on an O there. Sorry, I think I put it on an L. Uh, and also, I realised that there was a chat room full of enthusiastic young people. That were ha somehow happy to solve my problems. So on to problem sheet two. Problem sheet two had square roots in. This question here, is, we're not expecting the students to evaluate these things to three decimal places. We're expecting them to prove this by reasoning, right? How do you prove that root two plus root six is less than root 50? The idea is you, you get rid of the square roots, you can square both sides. You, you square both sides and then you, know, you square it once. And uh, you only have one square root, then you have like two root 12. I guess you get 8 plus 2 root 12 is less than 15. And then you shuffle things onto the other side, and you've got to prove that root 12 is less than 7. Then you, you know, 2 root 12 is less than 7. And then you square up again. You get, you've get you got to prove that 48 is less than 49. So, again, this is a question to see if students are capable of writing down a logical proof. Uh, but Lean had no square roots. It had the real numbers, but it had no square roots. But actually, in my course, later on in the course, I develop a basic theory of square roots. This is one of the things I lecture 
in the course, I explain how to formally define square roots by taking the supremum over a set of reals. Uh, and so I thought I would write a square root function. So I so I've jumped from problem sheet two to like problem sheet six. And uh, I developed a square root function and it worked. I, you know, I defined the square root of x to be the, you know, the least upper bound of all the real numbers whose square possess the next. And, and you know, I made this definition, and I could prove theorems about this definition. I could prove that you know, the square root of x squared was x, right? This isn't a computable definition. You can't evaluate the square root of two to three decimal places here. But you can prove theorems about the square root of two. And these are the theorems that I was proving in my course. So I did this. I wrote some really, really kind of appalling lean code. Uh, and then one of the people on the chat just saw what I was doing, you know, took pity on me wrote it properly and made a pull request to MathLib. And then all of a sudden I had access to square roots. So I could do problem sheet too. And you can see that, you know, things are really happening, right? I've come along with a question. You know, the question is, can I do my problem sheets and lean? This is real mathematics. And the answer is, well, we're not quite ready for it, but you know, somehow some of it's on the boundary of what we can do. So we can do it. You know, I'm not doing silly logic questions like in theorem proving and lean. I'm doing you know, what I perceive as proper mathematics, uh, and it's happening. And then we got to problem sheet three and it all fell apart uh, because problem sheet three involved, you know, the complex numbers and stuff that they, stuff that my students have learned at school. Lena got no complex numbers, but of course I could do, you know, I've got the hang of it now. So I made the complex numbers and you know, complex numbers defined to be a pair of real numbers. And I made a basic API for the complex numbers. And, uh, the PR got accepted into Lean's Maths Library and then instantly got completely, re, you know, an expert took a look at what I'd done and you know, realised it was horrific. And, uh, you know, because I'm very much an amateur in writing code at this point. So I completely rewrote it. So now I had to do, you know, now I had to do sine of x. Uh, so I wanted to define sine of x using the infinite power series definition, but they said it wasn't, I, it's, that wasn't the correct thing to be doing. And they didn't want that definition in their Maths Library. Uh, because the correct thing to do was to develop a theory of you know, multivariable calculus uh, and you know, go, go along what I perceive to be a huge detour. You know, develop a theory of differentiation and integration and topological vector spaces, you know, the way it was done in foundational maths textbooks like ball back in. So I was told you know, not, to, not to think about sine of x. Uh, so somehow I couldn't do problem sheet three, you know, which is in some sense an issue if I'm gonna be promoting this software in my lectures. Uh, but, you know, I pressed on and, you know, skip forward a few problem sheets, get to problem sheet eight, you know, which by this point you might think might be completely impossible to do in Lean. But actually problem sheet eight was really, really, really easy to do in Lean. I, I had enough of the skills now just to do that problem sheet myself, because this problem sheet was all about you know, just injective and surjective and bijective functions and equivalence relations. It was axiomatic mathematics. Right, the real numbers are a really complicated object, but an equivalence relation is something defined by a small number of axioms, and you type these axioms into, you know, they're there already, right? Somebody has typed these axioms into the system, and all of the, you know, even the, the theorems which the students find complicated about equivalence relations, these are, you know, these are things that, you know, because I understand the mathematics, I find it very easy to type it into Lean. These things were really, really trivial, and they were great fun as well. And so in some sense, I realized that my course, even though it seemed to be in a sensible order for mathematicians, you know, we were introducing concepts that they'd seen at school and then moving on to newer concepts. You know, pedagogically, my course was in the right order. But in terms of formalizing, my course was in the wrong order. And so in some sense, this is an obstruction, right? This means that theorem improvers can't just slot in to the mathematics curriculum at a university because the courses are not somehow written in an appropriate way. So term started and I just thought, you know, let's do it anyway. So I started, you know, I started teaching my course. I bounced back from the summer, spent the summer in California. And I bounced back and just started to enthuse uh, to other staff members about Lean. And uh, they were on the whole extremely uninterested in all these proper mathematicians I had access to because they could just see it's a toy, right? It's, it's buzzards found some toy and it clearly is enjoying playing computer games, but you know, it's not going to do, actually help. But how will it help a research mathematician? It's in it's in no position to help a research mathematician at this point. Uh, but I I love this, right? My I've done a I've been doing a lot of childcare uh, for the somehow fifteen years 
uh, preceding this, but uh, but by October 2017, my kids were going to secondary school and they were old enough to look after themselves. And I thought, right, I'm going to spend an evening a week. You know, I'm going to stay late at work one evening a week. And so I started a blog and I started an undergraduate club and, uh, and would use, use Lean in my lectures at times when it was appropriate. You know, I would use Lean when Lean was just making everything look easy. And uh, I found a whole bunch of undergraduates who were much more enthusiastic. You know, the staff was like, how is this going to help us? The undergraduates are like, you know, great. You know, you're turning your problem sheets into a game. And, you know, these kids have been brought up in a world. You know, these kids have never known a world without computers. Uh, you, know, you know, these kids were born in the year 1999, the kids I'm teaching. So, you know, they're far more receptive to the idea of doing wacky things with computers. Uh, so I got, you know, there was a first year undergraduate who was extremely smart. Uh, he clearly knew all the course I was teaching already. Uh, and so he started formalizing, uh, you know, I gave him an MSc level textbook in commutative algebra and said, you know, why don't you see if you can teach the computer this? Because I was beginning to understand uh, what these systems could do. And commutative algebra is, is just the same as equivalence relations. You know, a commutative ring is you know, a small number of axioms. It's a type with a small number of axioms. And then you can develop the entire theory you never need to think about complicated objects such as the real numbers or the complex numbers. Uh, you know, the, the theory is, is, is flying low to the ground. You know, the, the arguments appeal to the axioms. They don't appeal to big theories. You know, you're building the big theory. Commutative algebra is a big theory. Uh, but there was certainly none of it in Lean. So I said, why don't you just make some? Uh, and he started making PRs. It turned out he was extremely com competent computation as well. You know, he had, he, you know, he'd written a lot of code already. Uh, and so once I could see where this was going, I thought, what are we going to do? You know, this guy wants to learn some mathematics. He's clearly very talented. So I figured, well, why don't we do, why don't we define a scheme? Because schemes are something that I, you know, I don't really do commutative algebra, but I do do algebraic geometry sometimes. And a scheme is an object in algebraic geometry that's somehow quite respectable. You know, I'm telling the staff that I can do equivalence relations in lead, and they're like, equivalence relations are trivial. Well, you know. Schemes are not trivial, right? We don't teach schemes to the undergraduates. We teach schemes to the MSc students. Uh, so, you know, what are schemes? They were defined by Grothendieck in the 1960s. You know, they're, respect, you know, they're proper mathematics, for sure. Uh, they revolutionized algebraic geometry. They, you know, Grothendieck got a Fields Medal uh, for defining schemes. You know, this, this work at the time was regarded as, you know, groundbreakingly important. So I figured that, you know, this is a place to start. And uh, I also realized that I'm now collaborating with an undergraduate. And yeah, for, for me, I thought that was just really interesting because I never figured out what the undergraduates could give me. And now, now here, you know, I'm collaborating as an equal with an undergraduate because this guy, you know, I'm, I'm still doing my day job, right? I'm you know, managing admissions for our PhD program and lecturing courses. Whereas this first year undergraduate is completely on top of all the material. And, you know, if you left him alone, he'd just be playing World of Warcraft or something. Uh, but I've got him addicted to this software. And that, you know, it became quite clear by November that he was better at it than I was. Uh, so December, January, you know, Christmas, my course finished. And I had more time to think about this stuff. And I realized I'm collaborating with an undergraduate. But uh, we would get stuck. And we would ask on the chat, you know, and then some guy called Reed Barton, who seemed to know all about schemes, got us unstuck. And then it turns out that Reed Barton has got like four gold medals at the IMO and two gold medals at the IOI, the Computing Olympiad. It turns out this guy is some, you know, child prodigy, used to be some child prodigy, has, you know, been doing a PhD at Harvard and is also, you know, addicted to this software. And there he is on the, you know, I have free access to this guy. I just ask questions on the chat and he pops up and answers him. So by January 2018, we had a working definition. We've defined schemes, and for me, this is a, is a you know a massive milestone. So I was super excited, and nobody else was, right? Because the other undergraduates don't understand what schemes are. Uh, we have you know we have a world expert algebraic geometry in my department. We just hired we just hired a big name, Paolo Cascini, who just written a big paper with a Kasia Birkar, uh, you know, just proving a big conjecture in algebraic geometry. So I told him we'd formalised a scheme. And he was sort of like, yeah, yeah, I learned what a scheme was when I, I was an MSc student, he told me. 
if you still deeply unimpressed by this. Uh, and this was a blow. So I told the computer scientists on the lean chat that we defined a scheme, and they were also deeply unimpressed. Uh, because these people are paranoid, right? They said that maybe it's wrong. How do you know the definition of wrong isn't wrong? Well, I'm, a, I'm a professional mathematician. The definition is not wrong. And I was like, well, you know, you've got to, you've got to prove some theorems about this object, prove a theorem about schemes. And I'm just thinking, well, that's a bit of a tall order, actually. You know, the definition was really hard work, but proving a theorem would be even harder work. So I tell them this, and they're like, well, if you can't prove theorems with it, you know, maybe it's a useless definition. So this was somehow a shock uh, because you know I was just you know I was banging on about this on the you know, on things like math overflow, getting very excited and arguing that this is the future of mathematics. Uh, and and this had the consequence that other mathematicians were somehow drifting onto the chat. You know, serious people were appearing. Patrick Masso, you know, he's a topologist in all say. This is a very serious French university. You know, this guy must be an extremely you know extremely good mathematician. I noticed he'd just given a a seminar ball backing, and, you know, which is a quite a prestigious uh, seminar in France, named after you know, Nicolas Bourbaki, this, uh, this this collection of mathematicians that you know wrote a, a collection of books in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. They were they were formalizing mathematics, but on paper you know, before these systems existed. So Masso was a serious guy. Johann Kobelin was a postdoc, but he was a number theorist. Uh, he could actually understand what I'd done. You know, he was the first person that came along that could actually read my code. So he read my code. He pointed out that I got the definition wrong, actually. Was, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I had made a slip. And you see, we hadn't, we hadn't discovered this because I hadn't used it to prove any theorems. But you, you, finally, you know, someone had come along because they'd heard that I'd got interested and they'd heard of me because you know, I'm a, you know, I proved some theorems in number theory. But he learned, he learned to read the system. He pointed out the definition was wrong. So we had to do, you know, we had to make the computer science, you know, so now, of course, there's egg on my face because I'm telling people that we don't need to check my definition. And now it turns out we do need to check my definition. So we have to prove a theorem. So there are certain kinds of schemes called affine schemes. So we constructed, you know, we constructed these objects called affine schemes. You know, the clue is in the name. And then we proved the theorem that affine schemes were schemes. And again, that's another kind of a theorem that you can't you can't tell a mathematician that you've done a great thing because the mathematician is going to say it's sort of you know it sounds trivial but actually it was a lot of hard work uh, but now i was working with two undergraduates which was nice you know furthermore i you know again there's a lot of humor in this right I, we have a we have a world expert on how to handle finiteness in type theory or at least in lean type theory and again this is a first year undergraduate and he's become an expert on finiteness in type theory because he's just quietly coming to my club and formalizing his problem sheets. You know, he's doing questions about finite groups. So he had to learn about finite groups. So he had to learn about finite types. Uh, so we needed finiteness, you know, for some technical argument. So we wrote him in and we proved that affine schemes were schemes. And this, the computer scientists were happy with this. You know, they said, now we should prove another theorem. So Lau went off and they started proving other theorems. Uh, and to my mild surprise, the computer scientists are now telling me uh, but yeah, this work is now probably ready for publication. And for me, you know, I'm doing research in number theory, right? I'm doing proper mathematics. That's how I'm trying to make publications. You know, I'm doing some stuff involving Drinfeld modular forms and working with a postdoc. And, and you know, I know where my next publication is coming from, and it's you know some half-proved theorems that I'm you know I'm working with other proper mathematicians. But now all of a sudden, these computer scientists are telling me that I've done enough for publication. And I'm just thinking this is a joke, you know, because I've defined a scheme and a theorem prover, which is you know, sort of interesting, but it's hard, you know, it wasn't difficult. Uh, you know, we kind of got stuck, but we got stuck because we were amateurs, right? An expert could just knock this off. So I asked about how it had been done in all the other systems, you know, these systems that have been around for decades. And, uh, and the computer science informed me that, oh, no, this won't have been done before. Uh, and this is why I should publish it. And so it's at this point that things are dawning on me that, you know, this is a cheap publication as far as I can see, because I, I, all I've done is something which I knew full well how to do. But it turns out that I'm the first person to have done it, you know, me and these two first year undergraduates. So I'm telling them that perhaps we should write a paper. You know, I'm quite busy, so I told them to write the paper. But, you know, they're first year undergraduates. They don't have a clue how to write a paper. So this paper didn't get written for a long time. Uh, but I also 
make me start thinking. You know, Koch is a great example, right? Koch, they formalized some highly non-trivial mathematics in Koch. They formalized, you know, a Fields Medal winning theorem. Uh, you know, the Fields Medal is, you know, the, you know, the top prize in, uh, in pure mathematics. They'd formalized you know, a, a Fields Medal winning theorem from the 1960s. Uh, 19, yeah, from the 1960s, the theorem of Fight and Thompson. So I knew full well that there was a lot of finite group theory in Koch, but it turns out that this basic MSc mathematics uh, was just not there. And it, for me, it seems to be a far more natural thing to formalize, uh, you know, than going ahead and proving some technical theorem in an area which is now deeply unfashionable. You know, the, you know, the moment the classification of finite simple groups was announced, you know, people just started, people like Conway just left the area instantly. You know, they knew the big driving question had gone. So, so here I am, you know, I've, I've, got a, I've got a paper with two undergraduates or candidate for a paper. The code is still dreadful. Uh, and, and I can't find a mathematician who's remotely interested or like, not a proper mathematician. You know, I, I, you know, more and more, you know, undergraduates are interested and, you know, PhD students and postdocs are popping up on the Lean chat. You know, what is this, what is this software? We've heard that schemes have been formalized. Uh, oh, I've got a, uh, uh, but somehow computer scientists were interested, so I started getting invited to uh, computer science conferences, which was interesting. So I started going to computer science conferences, uh, and again, I, I just realised that these people were just doing the wrong thing. All the mathematics being formalised was being formalised in computer science departments. And computer scientists, why should they have any idea? about what fashionable mathematics is, right? Why should they have any idea, you know, about the kind of mathematics that would get mathematicians excited? I mean, clearly the computer scientists were getting excited, uh, but nothing I was seeing was making me, as a proper mathematician, re remotely excited. You know, the only thing I thought was interesting was my work on schemes, in some sense, because the other stuff I just couldn't see the point of it. Uh, you know, but this guy, you know, Kaushya Birkar was going to get a Fields Medal for his work on schemes, and I'd formalise the scheme in a theorem group. You know, I could probably state the theorem he's formalised in, in Lean, uh, but none of these people in computer science departments cared remotely who was getting the Fields Medal or what these Fields Medal people were doing. So Kamala and Amasa, who've arrived on the Lean chat now, and me, we decided to aim higher. So. I don't know if you can see this exciting notification there. Let's get rid of that notification. So in 2011, uh, Peter Schultz had discovered the notion of a perfectoid space. And now this has got a lot going for it, perfectoid space, because firstly, it sounds really fancy, right? It sort of sounds like a sort of a trendy thing. Uh, but secondly, it turned out they'd been phenomenally useful. He'd, so, he'd defined them to solve a problem in algebraic geometry, but they were, he'd then used them to do something in number theory. And some other people had used them to prove a, you know, a hard, a, you know, an old conjecture in commutative algebra, and they were kind of taking over, right? You know, they were a very technical definition. They sound quite sexy, and it's kind of very clear that Schultz is going to get the Fields Medal. Uh, but you know, how do you actually, you know, use perfectoid spaces? You have to be an expert in that area, and it turns out that that area is my area, right? And this is somehow what happens, right? This is why my area is fashionable, because, you know, new things can happen. The area sort of has, has momentum. Uh, and areas with momentum, that's where the proper mathematicians are going. So this definition is super, super technical. But guess who, you know, guess who the expert is at Imperial College London on perfectoid spaces? It's me. You know, we've organized a study group already, you know, way back 2013. You know, me and the other, you know, I, it's not just me. There's, you know, several other expert number theorists at Imperial College London and people at King's as well. You know, we had a joint study group, a London, you know, a London study group, just, you know, some staff members. And we'd really carefully read a lot of Schultz's work. So I knew this work, you know, very, very well. And I knew, full, you know, I'd seen what Lean could do. I knew full well that we could do this stuff in Lean. So we decided we were just going to go for it and formalise a perfect choice space. And we had, you know, we had a deadline, right? You know, but by 2018, these fields medals are going to be announced, mid-2018. And the idea is, you know, there's going to be a lot of noise about perfectoids. All of a sudden, they're going to be everywhere. We know that. They're going to be all over the popular maths literature. So we've got a deadline, and, uh, and we failed to meet that deadline because it turns out that making soft, super hugely complicated mathematics in a theorem prover that doesn't really know what the complex numbers is, 
uh, turns out to be a, you know, a very tall order. You know, Lean, Lean had these basic definitions of a, of a topological space and things like this, but it turns out that what we needed was an entire volume of you know this book by Borbaki, Topology Generale. You know, this is several hundred pages long, and formalizing a page of mathematics is hard work. And basically, it, most of it had to be done. But you know, Maso is the topologist. He knows this stuff, and you know, he's really enthused by the idea because he's feeling just the same as me. You know, he's convinced that these systems will change the world. But he's at a prestigious mathematics department, and he's having just the same problems. He's mentioning this this work to his colleagues. And his colleagues are, you know, not interested that these systems know what schemes are. So he threw himself into formalizing, you know, this, it's a very formally written book, you know, all the details are there, there are no references. It develops everything from first principles in the right order. Unlike my course, which is just doing bits and bobs and the lean difficulty was going crazily going up and down. Topology Generale was all written in the right order. And it was just a case of teaching this stuff to the computer. And, uh, you know, he did it and he found a couple of mistakes along the way. Uh, but, but once we had that, that was enough foundations uh, for us to, to, you know, meet with him. We sort of started in the middle doing technical arithmetic geometry and waiting for the theories about top, top, topology to appear. Uh, and then, you know, come 2018 and here come the fields medalists. So there you go. There's the definition of fashionable mathematics in 2018. So Burkhar has got his. Uh, for proving a theorem in algebraic geometry that he proved with, you know, in part for work we've done with Cassini, this guy at Imperial, who poo-pooed my work on schemes. And Schultz has got his for perfectoid spaces. And Venkatesh is just someone I've known for a while, you know, because he, again, he's someone in my area. Figali, I didn't know, so I've, I've never talked to him about this stuff. But, uh, but Venkatesh I knew very well, so, you know, I told him that we were working on schemes, on perfectoid spaces. And Schultz, I told them too. But we wanted something, you know, so all of a sudden, perfectoid spaces are all over the literature. And we wanted something to show people. Uh, and so we kind of started cheating. In, instead of building up the theory from the bottom, which you're supposed to do with these formal proof verification systems, uh, we started at the top. We wrote some definitions. So here was a definition we had very early on. And, the, you know, this, the great thing about this definition is if you know something about, you know, formal proof verification systems and the concept of an inductive type or a structure, you know, or a class, you can kind of see that this looks like a class, right? Whereas on the other hand, and, and it compiles, right? It is a class, it, comp you know, it is a structure, it compiles in Lean. Uh, but on the other hand, if you're a proper mathematician, a professional working mathematician, You've never used this software before in your life, but you can read this code, right? And this is important. And you know what a perfectoid, if you work in my area, you know what a perfectoid ring is. You know that a perfectoid ring is a complete Hausdorff tape ring, that, you know, a, a complete Hausdorff uniform tape ring, which has some technical property. You know, it has a, a, a pseudo uniformizer with some property. And you can read this definition and you can see it there. That's readable to an expert that can understand you know, that, that already knows what a perfectoid ring is. And, uh, and of course, the, the, the problem is that half of these definitions, we don't have the definition, you know, we've defined a perfectoid ring, but we haven't defined what, you know, we haven't defined a pseudo uniformizer. You know, there's, there's stuff that's missing. Surjective is just some function thing. We know what surjective is. But half of these words, we haven't defined the words yet. So we started at the top and at the bottom. And apparently this is a terrible, a terrible strategy. So we built from the top down, you know, top down and bottom up at the same time. Uh, and we were told that this was a risky approach, but we were sort of gambling, you know, we're gambling that these things are going to meet in the middle. But they did, they glued together in the middle and we'd done it, right? We got stuck, again, we got stuck. We were, now we've become experts, but now we were making very technical mistakes. Yeah, you know, we still weren't, yeah, you know, we still weren't computer scientists. But the people in the chat would just solve our problems the moment they came up. And the computer scientists complained about our definitions, but we weren't trying to do mathematics here, right? This is a gimmick, right? We've done this specifically to sell this stuff to mathematicians. So we proved that the empty space was a perfectoid space. That was surprisingly difficult, actually. We're still, we're still trying to prove that there exists a non-empty perfectoid space. Uh, we have a plan for doing it, but a, a lot of theorems need to be proved before we can do that. You know, these things are highly non-trivial mathematical objects, but all of a sudden, 
people like Cashini, you know, this big shot algebraic geometer, suddenly he's sort of saying, oh, yeah, I, this is kind of cool. And then, you know, a few months later, he's saying, oh, you're popping up on my phone. You know, I gave a talk at Microsoft and, you know, Google is telling him that he should watch my talk. And Ben Katesh, who I've been, you know, keeping up to date with, uh, he sent me an email saying he was very impressed with this. Ben Katesh is at the IAS, the Institute for Advanced Study uh, in Princeton, you know, an extremely prestigious institution. And uh, lo and behold, one of my co-authors got invited to speak at the IAS, which was, you know, absolutely, you know, a big bonus. He spoke about Lean in front of all these, you know, really serious mathematicians. And I got, you know, I was invited to speak in Cambridge and Oxford and things like this. So word was kind of coming round. So I told Schultz that we'd done it. Schultz was the guy that invented these things. And he said, could we prove the main theorem about them? And I told him we couldn't prove anything about them. You know, we can't even construct one single interesting example. And so then he kind of lost interest. So he kind of knows, you know, he hasn't, he now understands what these things can do and is still very much of the opinion that they can't do anything for him. So he lost interest and we wrote a paper. This is a really funny paper because, you know, to, to understand it, you have to sort of know about these formal proof verification systems. And you also have to know about perfectoid spaces. And there's loads of people know about perfectoid spaces and loads of people know about formal proof verification systems. But the number of people who know about both is like an extremely small set. This is this is the problem. There needs to be more synergy, right? Mathematicians and computer scientists need to start talking to each other. So we read this paper, you know, at the time, you know, the, the collection of people that you, you know, is there millions of people, you know, thousands of people are experts in one of the two areas you needed to be to understand these things. But essentially nobody was an expert at both, right? So there you go, there's a there's a challenge. Just read my paper, right? And suddenly, you know, mathematicians start now appearing. You know, it's working. You know, PhD postdocs are appearing. Like young staff members are appearing. Uh, you know, young the three Italian number theorists just appeared out of the blue. You know, all of them, you know, all of them tenured mathematicians doing serious mathematics. You know, beginning to ask, can I do my kind of mathematics in lead? And I'm like, yeah, definitely. You know, there, there'll be some background work, but you know, let's make a start. So the one thing we didn't do uh, was that we kept we didn't we didn't get our code into Lean's maths library. Lean's maths library makes no attempt to be backwards compatible. Uh, we did not get our code into Lean's maths. We had a big list of things that we should you know we should make PRs, but we made PRs at too slow a rate. And the next thing we knew, our code didn't compile anymore. Yeah, you know, so it probably doesn't want anything as fancy as perfectoid spaces. But it, you know we developed some a whole bunch of MSc level mathematics. You know, about 50% of what we did was MSc level and, and we didn't get it in. We got about a quarter of it in and then somehow ma the maths library diverged from our code. Uh, so the project still compiles with the official Lean 3, uh, but there was a fork made by the community and you know, the, the fork changed a lot of things and MATLAB changed as well. So it doesn't compile anymore. But as I say, I don't care because we just, you know, it wasn't, it was a gimmick, right? It was, a, it was, a, it was pure advertising. So now the upshot is that some mathematicians know that there's this weird thing called lean and they don't really know what it is, but they, you know, they're getting to see because I, I put, I put articles, you know, people ask me to write articles and the notices of the AMS has got, a, you know, the last but one issue, got an article by me just explaining to mathematicians in a way that mathematician understands explaining what this software does. So we're getting there, right? You know, this thing is just beginning to appear on the horizon of some mathematicians and some younger mathematicians, you know, are getting involved, which is really exciting. The maths library uh, is going from strength to strength. You know, I, if you look at you, know, you look at the commits, it's, uh, it's it's just somehow lockdown was very good for us. Lockdown just made you, know, the, you could see the derivative chain was going up, 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 up. Then lockdown, and then suddenly, you know, it started uh, it started going really quickly. So just to, at the very end, I, I, you know, the most exciting thing really. Is at the end of 2020, Schultz got in touch with me again. Uh, and Schultz challenged me. He know he understands, right? He's not using this stuff, but he understands what it can do. And uh, he proved a theorem. And uh, yeah, but he's somehow convinced that now he's now he's famous. He's convinced that people aren't reading his work properly. You know, he said to me, "Did you have a study group on my paper?" And I said, "Yes." This, you know, this this paper about liquid mathematics. And he said, "Did you carefully read and check?" this specific proof. And I said, no, we didn't. We just kind of like skipped over it. And he's like, well, there's the problem. So 
all over the world people are having study groups on my paper but when you actually get to this important theorem people aren't reading the details they just figure you know it's technical and people are just figuring oh it's schultz and so it's bound to be fine and this is exactly how problems slip in so he challenged us to he found one specific theorem he understands what the software will do but he's not going to do it himself and he thinks that the software is up to checking one of these theorems because he he knows the nature of the proof and he can see that it's the kind of stuff that Lean will do very well so he's challenged us to check one of his theorems so he said we'd try and over christmas now of course there's number theorists on the chat so i get a few number theorists together and uh, you know the, the problem suddenly becomes viable and last thursday big news we've got the statement compiling so now we can state Schultz's theorem, and we've made the code public now. It's on the Lean Prover Community uh, GitHub site. So we've got that statement compiling, and the code's public. The statement isn't really. Re I have, I'm not banging on about it on social media yet, but we we have a statement. You know, we've turned Schultz's challenge into a computer game, right? And, and people that are interested in playing that computer game, you know, there's now some big motivation here. Can we prove one of his theorems? And of course, we think we can, because we think we can do anything, right? We think this is going to change the world. So I have to stop. So you know, Lean 3 is a dream to work with. One reason for this is that Lean, tax, lean tactics are written in Lean. This, this seems to be a big deal. You know, th this is not true for many of the other systems. Lean tactics are written in Lean, which somehow makes tactics, I think, a lot more fun to write or a lot easier to write or something. I don't really know, or easier to debug or something. But, yeah, I'm not a computer programmer. Uh, but this is a big deal. Lean 4 was released only this month. And not only are many Lean 4 tactics written in Lean, but actually most of Lean 4 is written in, more of Lean 4 is written in Lean than in any other language. This language is really, Lean 4 is really extensible now. And it looks really exciting. There's a whole bunch, there's a Lean 4 thing on the a stream of a Lean chat. And it's full of people getting very excited about Lean 4 and asking lots of questions. And, you know, people are sort of saying, oh, it's faster than Haskell to, to do some things. And you can write, you know, you can you can reason about your code as well. So of course the big problem is that we've got a poor math lab. So that's a problem for the math mathematicians, but really for the computer scientists, I think that you know this stuff works now. The mathematicians have shown that it's a dream to code in, but all the people that are doing Haskelly stuff or formally verified things, now we need to attract them. And I'm not very good at that, uh, but that's why I give talks places like here. You see. I, th I think this Lean 4 has got a lot of potential. You, you know, all the things are there. You know, the, the fact that 450,000 lines of code has been written in it and it compiles and works you know, me means that Lean 3 works and Lean 4 is just better. Lean 4 is better. You know, it's, it's compiled, not interpreted. And uh, it's, you know, who knows what it's going to do. But I think it's got potential. Uh, thank you very much. And sorry for overrunning. Thanks for that presentation. That was really interesting. <laughs> we, have, we have questions from the audience. Uh, Phil, you raised your hand. Ah, sorry, Charles. Uh, Phil Wadler. Hi. Oh, thank you, Charles. That's very kind. Um, thank you, Kevin, for the talk. That was really interesting. Thanks. Um, so, I've done some work with Haskell and some work with Hagda. I keep hearing about Lane. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned yeah. Lane to be faster than Haskell. That's sort of fighting words for me. Do you it, want it, to hear about that a bit? You need to talk to a computer scientist. Leo, has, Leo there's, there's this paper by Leo called Counting Immutable Beans or something, uh, where he and Peyton Jones or something have had some sort of insight uh, about mm -hmm. caching or something. I, I have no idea what I'm talking about. But they, you know, they they've done some unit tests, and they're claiming, you know, for, for certain, you know, for certain things, it's running faster than Haskell. You know, once you compile it to C. And okay, so I've you know, I'm not, I'm not I'll ask, Thank I'll, you. I'll tell, I'll tell you where to ask. Get onto the Lean chat, and you know, and, and simply ask this question, in, you know, in the Lean Four stream, and you will get coherent answers from smart people. Well, I get shocked. You, you'll get people will take you very seriously <laughs> but you'll get answers that's what you, that's what you get on the lean chat
Okay, and, and which technology is the Lean Chat? Oh, it's Zulip. Zulip Chat. Yeah, dot org. Okay, yeah. great. That, and I use Agda Can you say anything about the um, comparison or trade offs between Lean and Agda? So the kernel is smaller because Leo is more paranoid. Yeah, Agda is like a type theory experiment, right? Like, oh, let's try mutually nested inductive you know, recursive types. You know, they throw some things in and, you know, and then somebody finds, you know, somebody manages to prove false. And so they tinker it with a bit. And, you know, this is, Agda is kind of an, ex an experiment in type theory. That's my perception of Agda. Whereas Lean has got a very minimal kernel. You know, it's got inductive types, it's got quotients and, uh, and pi types, and that's it really. Uh, I can actually report to you my one triumph in Agda, which is there's a fellow named Jesper Kockix, and, and he wrote to me and said, can you write a letter supporting me working on, on this topic to uh, a research foundation? I said, why are you working on that topic? You should be working on exactly the thing you mentioned, Kevin, getting a small uh, kernel, which is something that Jesper had ex uh, uh, expressed interest in in the past. I said, look, you said you were interested in this. You should do this. It'd be, this would be really helpful. And he said, okay, I thought about it. I'll apply for that instead. And we got the grant. So I'm hoping now the active community will move closer towards having this small kernel, but you're absolutely I, right. They don't have it now. It's important to do experiments in type theory, right? There's plenty of interesting questions in type theory that we need to figure out the answer to. You know, there's cubicle type theory. There's all sorts of interesting stuff. And there's a whole community of people thinking about that stuff. But Leo is paranoid, right? Leo thinks that the moment a system proves false, then this system stops being taken seriously. You know, and Agda and Koch have all proved false in the past. And Leo is very proud that Lean has never proved false. You know, there's no formally verified proof of false in any version of Lean through. Uh, and, and so this is something, you know, but of course then people come along wanting to do computer science. And uh, they, you know, they complain that it's limited because you can't do whatever, you know, mutually recursive. You can't prove false. <laughs> <laughs> you can't prove false. Yeah, no. <laughs> and a crummy system is this, you know. So, so it's not for everybody. It very much depends. It's just like programming languages, right? It's what do you want to do? You know, there are some things uh, that it turns out the lead is very. I want to do classical mathematics. So for me, it's really important that uh, you know the law of the excluded middle is. And the axiom of choice are just embedded in the kernel. Yeah, they're exactly what I want. And, uh, and the, the maths library has been developed, you know, and the tactics are all developed with classical logic in mind. But for some people, you know, this is, this is, a, you know, this is a, a killer. Right? Yeah, classical, I, 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 I would regard having the law of the excluded middle as tantamount to being able to prove false. Right, because, yeah, <laughs> because it, 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 it lets you do magic, right? And if it lets you do, if it lets you magically solve questions you want to solve, you're in trouble. But for me, you know, all of these fields now that's uh, using classical mathematics, even maths departments, constructive mathematics died out 100 years ago. It died out with Brouwer, Hilbert won, and that's the end of it. But in computer science departments, I'm well aware that it's a different story. But of course, you don't have to use it. But the thing about not using it is that you might then be a bit restricted in which tactics you can use, because Lean's tactics uh, use law of the extreme middle liberally. So if you ask tactics to develop proofs for you, then you might find that some of these proofs are using the law of the exclusion as well. Well, the interesting consequence of using classical mathematics is it will be harder to extract useful code from your right. But you see, the, the people I'm talking to, they're not interested in computation, right? They think the, the proof of the, of the four color theorem is ugly because it reduces it to thousands of special cases and then you have to compute. Right? Whereas the proof of the Poincaré conjecture is beautiful because there's no special cases to deal with. You just reason and you reason and you reason and eventually the thing becomes a triviality. You see, it's just a different, you know, the computation is ugly to a proper mathematician. So, and, and this is what I, this is the direction I've been pushing the maths library. You know, let's make it great for reasoning. And, you know, it's a, you want to add two polynomials, it's a catastrophe, right? Because the polynomial code is all non-computable. Of course, it could be made constructive, but then you just have problems. You know, then you get people starting to complain that you know they can't get their proofs working because Lean has found two different instances of a you know how to decide equality on their base field. You know, whereas we just you know we just assume that decidable equality is true by magic. 
and, and we can prove theorems about polynomials, but we can't compute with them. Whereas in Koch, you can compute with polynomials great, but you know they've got fewer theorems about them because it's harder to prove theorems about polynomials. So can I ask a question? Now that you've gone through this long um, uh, journey, ha has it changed what you think about uh, constructive mathematics? No, I still think it's a complete waste of time. Okay. I, I'm absolutely adamant. This is, this is where I put my problem mathematician. I need to appeal to the people that I, the, where's the money coming from, right? Who's giving out the big prizes? Who's giving out the big grants? In my, you know, my ecosystem, it's the proper mathematicians. And the proper mathematicians think the constructive mathematics is just a, you know, not worth, it's, it died a hundred years ago. And it doesn't these, have any sympathy for constructive mathematics help proving and lean, making that a little bit easier? I, I thought it's, that using construction stuff in the lean proofs actually helps the proof go by, but go through better. This is just a really common viewpoint. Of course, constructivism is going to help people say, but the thing is, we just don't, you know, we don't prove things like that. We don't prove things with heavy reports. We don't just say, this is a complicated thing. I claim that X equals Y. The proof is dig right down to the definition and you'll find that X is by definition equal to Y. That's not okay. what proofs look like. Our proofs are just sequences of rewriting. We're constantly rewriting. We so don't do care you about it. You mentioned that yeah, uh, you're proving that there exists, uh, uh, you, uh, your attempt to prove that there exists a non, uh, non-trivial, <laughs> is, is, okay. is that a constructive or, or, or is that a not constructive proof or, or, or are, you just, are you just using the law of excluded middle or classical logic somewhere in there? Classical logic everywhere. There, there is no constructive proof that a non-empty perfectoid space exists because I need algebraic, I need to, the first thing I need to do is construct an extremely large field. Uh, mm -hmm. I need to construct the algebraic closure of the periodic numbers. And I believe that there's no way of doing that classically. Ah. If there exists an algebraic closure of a field, you, so, you take some horrible limit. So I find, I find, I find it all quite a, quite a bit humorous. Um, oh, yeah. If, if yeah. mathematics is supposed to be a tool, uh, okay, then what good no. is a tool where, where you, you can, can construct a single no, instance? No, 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 no. I, I know, I, Applied mathematicians think mathematics is a tool, and these are the people that are using things like Mathematica and Python, right? But pure mathematics is a complete waste of time. This is the thing that pure mathematics is blue sky research, you know, and it's all funded under this, this claim that we don't know which bits of it will be useful in 50 years' time. But I, you know, I did the Piatic Langlands philosophy before this, and for sure, the Piatic Langlands philosophy can only be used as a tool to do other, you know, abstract areas of pure mathematics. The Piatic Langlands philosophy is not going to make mobile phones better, or it's not going to do anything for crypto. The, pure, the Piatic Langlands philosophy is just a beautiful statement that some hugely uncountably infinite set is canonically in bijection. With some other hugely uncountable infinite set, right? It's it's just a it's just a it's just like a beautiful work of art. It's it's of no use to anyone apart from, you know, it's just of use to people that like that kind of art. People like me, you know, I do it because it's beautiful, not because it's useful. None of this stuff is going to be useful, so it doesn't it doesn't need to run. We, we've had at, we had literally zero problems defining perfectoid spaces. And of course, now I've got an MSc student you know, working on proving the tilting correspondence. And also he has had zero problems with the fact that absolutely nothing is computable. We just write non-computable theory at the top of our files to stop lean whinging on that you know, we've used the axiom of choice in our definitions. We, we are, we are the, the math lib is a completely non-computable life. And if you want computability, then use COP because that, they, they continue, they, you know, that's one of the cornerstones of what they're doing. But that's because the people writing COP code are in computer science departments, where computability is still regarded as, you know, is, is, is an important thing. You know, I had no idea that constructivists existed until 2017. I thought they'd died. I, I, you know, I thought they'd died out with the art. So, I mean, so, I'm so, really surprised to find that, so that the you have, is seriously. So we have two communities with kind of diametrically opposed views of the world and yeah. and when we want to bring them together how do we breach that gap i i i am not interested in what the constructivists want if, if 
I am not interested in building a constructed maths library. They've done that in Kong and it didn't work, right? They, I mean, it's worked great for the computer scientists. They can compute pi to a million decimal places. They can compute, you know, they can compute integrals that show up in maths papers. You know, they can formally verify, you know, important claims in things like, you know, in, in sort of serious maths papers. But, but somehow, we are not interested. We're more interested in doing something. We're more interested. But you, in, you, in, you your very yeah. last statement was that you want to try and attract more computer scientists. Oh, but now you're well, telling me that you're not interested in what I, they're interested in. I, I do not want to get computer scientists looking at MathLib, right? That's the last thing they should be looking at, because I don't think there's things in there that they want, right? They should, be, if they want constructive mathematics, if they want to be able to compute what the sum of two polynomials is, rather than just having a theorem that it's also a polynomial, right? That's what we have, and that's fine for me. <laughs> uh, but if you want to, if you want a constructive maths library, you're going to have to build one, but you, it's, you're going to find it difficult to get mathematicians involved because mathematicians oh, okay. do, do not get taught. You're, you're, you're going to find it hard to get computer scientists involved, even I though know. that's what you really want. But I think computer, computer scientists should start doing other stuff. They should maybe start doing program verification. I think maybe now with Lean4, maybe it's ready for program verification. But I don't think you need too much mathematics to do program verification. You know, I think you need the basics and the very foundations of MATLAB are written by computer scientists and they are constructive. You know, the, th the theory of finite types we have is, is constructive. You know, it assumes decidable equality on all your types and blah, blah, blah. You know, all this stuff. And the moment I start writing my stuff, I just switch on, you know, I switch on the axiom that says that all types have got decidable equality and, and just press on from there. But you don't have to switch that on. You see, there, there are parts of that maths library you can use, but there's a whole bunch of it that's of no use to you. But I don't think you need that stuff to do the kind of thing that computer scientists do. But I'll tell you what some computer scientists do. They use AI you know, to, try and, to try and do machine learning and figure out how to prove theorems automatically. And for that stuff, I think it's essential. You know, these, for these people, we're building a gigantic... Those people don't care if we're constructive or classical at all, right? Because those people are just guessing what the next line of the proof is, you know, based on heuristics. And, and if we tell, you know, if we train them on a 450,000 line maths library that's using classical logic, then their then their AIs will just learn classical logic. So, you know, there's there's computer scientists that might be interested in math lib, but constructivists, Lean Lean Four has that axiom built into its kernel, but you don't have to use it, right? And it keeps track. It does keep track. If I if I look at an arbitrary thing I've proved, I can print the axioms that we used, and it will say, "Oh, look, you use the law of the excluded middle and the axiom of choice." Like big deal, you know. Whereas, whereas, Lean will keep track of that, but I just never look. But if you want to keep track of it and then actually use the fact that you can, you know, that your functions are computable, then then that's great. You know, it, it's still you can still use it. You just can't use the maths library. But anyway, you can't. I'll tell you why you can't use the mass library because the mass library doesn't exist, right? <laughs> I don't know how long it's going to take to port it, but that's the big. You know, that's the next big job now. So, so, Kevin, you talked a lot about how awesome the Zulip chat community is, and they totally are. I feel like they have their their feet in both worlds, like they're computer scientists and they're mathematicians. They're totally sympathetic to using constructive mathematics effectively when they can use it as a tool for classic mathematics. Um, there's, there's constructivists on that chat. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm presenting a very biased view, but I'm just presenting yeah, no, a point. <laughs> right. But you, you can find constructivists who know exactly, you know, but I, I had a PhD student who wrote a tactic and he told me that he had to learn about, because, you know, he had to learn what it was. The student wrote a tactic for, you know, solving, solving group theoretic problems, solving group theoretic goals in Lean. And he says he uses, you know, he uses decidability all the time now, he says. You know, he actually really has to use types for which things are decidable. I was quite surprised. Right. So, you know, so some of the people that are writing tactics certainly have to know what it is. But the point is, I never write a tactic, right? I'm far more interested in taking some you know, MSC level, some MSC level textbook and just working, working with that stuff and trying to teach it lean. And there, it, it just, you know, it's a disaster. I, I can't yes. use, I can't use constructive mathematics because I can't, I can't define a scheme constructively. That's the, right. That's, that's the thing. I can't define a scheme. Because a scheme, you know, you have a scheme is a topological affine schemes 
But the proof that a, an affine scheme is a topological space uses the law of the excluded middle. You know, it, it's not it's not possible to prove it constructively. So you know, constructivism just has to go. If if I want to appeal to the people like you know, if we if I if I embrace constructivism, then I can't talk about schemes anymore. I certainly can't talk about perfectoid spaces. And now all of a sudden, all my marketing is is gone. I, I need non-constructivism, but you can do constructive stuff, and apparently it's fast. But I'm not the person to talk to. Yeah. Do, do, do does they have chats? How does this work? How does how does Google Meet how does Google Meet work? Is there a chat? It, yeah, there's a chat tab. I think Charles. Chat is, is where you can Google. type stuff. Yeah, I was just trying to find it. I was going to. It's right on the top, on the right. It oh, looks like oh, a little yeah, yeah, uh, cartoon it, yeah. blurb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Found it. Thanks. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll find you the. We're, we're, we're about 15 minutes over, but I, I have one final question to close it. First, thank you so much, Professor Buzzard, for coming oh, to. Uh, yeah, no uh, problem. Giving you a lecture. We really appreciate it. It's always a lot of fun. Uh, does the lean community have any ultra finitists in it? You know, something that would make like uh, Dorian Zeilberger happy? Yeah. It wouldn't surprise me if you could find. Oh yeah, I, there's some guy called Michael Beeson that's somehow happily formalizing logic. I, he's certainly you know, a hardcore constructivist. I don't know if he's an ultra finitist, but this, this is what you see, right? He popped up at the beginning. He asked a hundred questions. And then he started asking more sensible questions at a lower frequency. And then he realized he had enough. And then he just sort of disappeared. And he's just busy working on his repository. He's formalizing a bunch of constructive logic. Uh, and he, you know, he's learned it. And he's got the hang of it. And he doesn't answer questions. So, but you know, on the other hand, if you came up with a constructivist question, you know, and if you ask if you ask some question, he'd pop out the woodwork. You know, he gets notifications when people ask questions. But yeah, there are a bunch of people out there, even in maths departments. But I, yeah, I, ultra finitists. I don't know. I don't. I don't even know what that is. That's like believing there's only finitely many numbers or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the, just, the, that's the, cranky, the, the right? It's, you see, it's, you see, these these, <laughs> the, these people, you have to be careful, right? Because. You know, maybe there's some interesting things you could do in lean with ultra finitism, but the problem is I I need to be careful that I'm not perceived of as a crank, right? I'm, you know, I'm already perceived of as slightly. I mean, look, look at these trousers, right? So I'm, I'm already sort of quite an old school, uh, but I'm respected as a mathematician at this point in my life. And if I start going on about ultra finitism or constructivism. Then all of a sudden things might go downhill quite quickly, right? This, you know, this sort of happened to Voivodsky. He's he started working on constructive mathematics in COP and introduced the univalence axiom. And he was at the Institute for Advanced Study, but he got there by doing classical mathematics, by doing algebraic geometry. And then all of a sudden he started doing this constructive stuff, and suddenly he was kind of rather isolated. And uh, you know, the, the, the proper mathematicians weren't talking about his work anymore. The only reason that any mathematicians at all know about Voivodsky's work in constructivism is after he, you know, he sadly died in 2017, and there were sort of conferences and you know, and uh, eulogies and things written about him, where they explain how he did these amazing things in algebraic geometry, and then he did this kind of weird constructive stuff. Here's some kind of overview for proper mathematicians about what he did, but the proper mathematicians don't really buy it. It's, it's sort of funny, and you you have to stay fashionable. Yeah, I don't, I don't so want to touch Melville If, if just, people oh. want to learn more about Lean, uh, where do where do they go? Uh, I posted. I posted in the chat uh, the uh, the link to the Lean chat. This is a bit an extremely friendly place. Uh, there's, there's a stream called New Members, and you can ask any question you like there, however stupid. Some of the experts don't follow that stream; they have it muted. But people like me that are always keen on onboarding new people. Uh, very quick to respond in new members. And uh, and the other place to look, I'll post one more thing. Uh, and it is that we have our own community website. We forked Lean. You know, we, Lean 3 just remained, you know, Leo was like, I've had it with Lean 3, I'm going to work on Lean 4. Uh, the other place that you need to know about is this. Uh, this, is our, this is our community website where the people that maintain the fork uh, 
and maintain the maths library they all hang out there there's a lot of information about there about how to get started you know things things that one can read things things that one can read. yeah it's just it's just a lot of things so th those are the two you know, those are the two two places to start right. hey Ray, i enjoyed the talk oh thank you yeah thanks so much yeah all this is going to be killing me i, I was very foolish it was oh, great. A lot of fun. Great. Yeah, thank you very much. It was great. Oh, thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, no problem at all. Thanks for the invitation.